Research into low-pitched labrosomes, which preceded the invention of the valve, has undergone significant activity in recent years. Today, serpents, ophicleides, and other forms of base horn are being studied, played, and manufactured to high standards across the world. However, critical approaches to developments which followed Wilhelm Wieprecht and Johann Gottfried Moritz's patent of the base tuber in 1835 are still relatively rare. Such discussions of developments in instrument building, playing, and the associated repertoire are indeed often dismissed as unnecessary. In the words of Clifford Bevan, quote, in the 1850s, after fewer than 20 years, the bass tuba became practically the instrument it is today. This paper questions such assertions, focusing on perhaps the most consequential instrument that emerged following the original Berliner bass tuba, the so-called Wiener tuba. Later, we'll discuss how craftsmen's practices and construction's methods for these instruments evolved across Europe, outlining the practical and technological challenges behind their creation and suggesting how they can be implemented within contemporary practice, as well as demonstrations using excerpts from contemporaneous orchestral compositions. But first, a bit of background on the Wiener tuba itself. In April 1836, several months after the invention, the bass tuba was presented to Gaspari Spontini, director of the Staatskapelle in Berlin, and it's speculated that Richard Wagner first heard this instrument while attending a performance of a hastily revised and since unfortunately lost version of his opera, Ferdinand Cortez, sorry, Spontini's opera, Ferdinand Cortez, in Berlin later that year. It would be in his first season as Hofkapellmeister at the Königlich Sächsische Musikalische Kapelle in Dresden from 1843 to 44 that Wagner would first work with a tubist directly, Gottfried Hinker. Hinker may have used his tuba to perform Wagner's Parisian Serpent and Ophiclede parts for works such as Ein Faust Overture, shown here, where Wagner changed the instrument name when translating the instruments from French to German. While duplicate performance material for Tannhäuser shows Ophicle in pencil next to the printed tuba, However, it's in Lohengrin, premiered in 1850, where Wagner first writes a part that is only playable with a bass tuba. Three years later, Wagner began working on Der Ring des Nibelungen, later writing that, quote, until now I have used several instruments in the Nibelungen that I first discovered a long time ago from the instrument builder Sax in Paris, presumably referring to his visit to Paris in October 1853. There's no primary source evidence to confirm this visit, and contemporaneous francophone orchestration works do not suggest any deployment of sax horns in the orchestra, but Wagner's sketches nevertheless mention one sax horn contrabass transposed for the E-flat contrabass sax horn. By the time performances of excerpts from Rheingold and Valkyra were being organized in Vienna in 1862, the instrument was referred to as a contrabass tuba in E-flat, and Wagner noted that the instrument, quote, could be found in the Austrian military bands, although perhaps under different names, maybe also in different tunings. The parts for these performances describe the instrument as a bombardon, and Franz Fretzer performed them using his new tuba Hellingkon in C. The instrument used in the first Munich performance of Das Rheingold und die Valkyrie in 1869 and 1870 is less clear. Despite communication between the conductor of the Hofkapelle Hans von Bülow and Wieprecht and Moritz regarding the new instruments. There's no evidence of Moritz's promised contrabass tuba being delivered for inspection. Bülow never conducted the premieres, and Wagner disavowed the whole production, while more recent writings have failed to shed any light on the situation, such as orchestral biographer Hans Joachim Nössel noting only that, quote, evidently things were managed somehow. In preparation for the first ring performances at Bayreuth, Wagner asked his protégé and hornist Hans Richter to organize the labrosomes. His request to his publishers in 1873 that, quote, the contrabass tuba is to be transposed to C as it has been performed so far, shows awareness of the C helicon used by Fretzer in 1862, though Richter would hire a new tubist, Otto Waldemar Brooks, for the orchestra in Vienna in 1875, and also engage him to play at Bayreuth for the first rehearsal period that summer. In October that year, a tuba was ordered for Brooks from the Berlin instrument maker Ernst Leberecht Paulus and it can be assumed played by him at Bayreuth in 1876. This tuba, likely the one illustrated here, followed the five-valve design of Moritz, as will be discussed shortly by Jake, and was eventually replaced at the Staatsoper by a new instrument from Leopold Ullmann in 1885. While Brooks was only to stay in Vienna for one season, a tradition had been founded whereby this instrument, variously described contemporaneously as a bass or contrabass tuba, and known today as a Wiener tuba, became the standard orchestral instrument. As such, it was used in early performances of much Austro-Germanic music from this era for over half a century, 
from Wagner and Brahms through Buchner and Mahler to Strauss, Schoenberg, and Berg. There are also direct links between the Wiener tuba and the orchestral implementation of five and six valve tubas in England and France at this time, all instruments distinct from those designed for use in military and marching bands, which were known up until the early 20th century as bombardons. Such distinctions and their subsequent disappearance will be discussed after Jake now goes through a craftsman's perspective on how such instruments were developed across Europe over the long 19th century. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I think as most of us know, the original Moritz bass tuba in F was made and patented in Berlin on the 12th of September, 1835 as a collaborative work between J.G. Moritz, his son C.W. Moritz, and Potsdam Kapellmeister Wilhelm Wieprecht. Their patent was for the bell flare and for the valve tubing layout, combined with five of their 15 millimeter bore Berliner valves, which they had patented two years earlier. They made around 84 to 86 instruments between the years 1835 to 1844, delivering many of them across Europe as far as Russia. The bass tuba was extremely successful as an instrument and as a status symbol. When compared to its contemporaries, it was, quote, louder and far easier to bring the musicians up to speed. However, even for the standards of the time, it was labor intensive, not only to produce, but to maintain. In addition, it did not at least easily allow for flexible standards of intonation and pitch, and the immediate development of this instrument would be highly dependent on how it was copied and then modified in the decades that followed both within and outside the Prussian Empire. In the 1820s, Jakob Wall of Landskrona, Sweden, was granted a scholarship from the King of Sweden to study wind instrument manufacturing in Germany. Some early Wall instruments have a design very similar to instruments from makers in Berlin, and it's quite likely that Wall visited Moritz's workshop at some point. The Prussian Kaiser gifted a bass tuba to the King of Sweden in 1836, from which it is likely Val made inspired copies. However, with three to six valves, both Moritz style Berliner Pumpen or the newly designed rotary valves. In addition, also some of the Moritz's bracing and ferrule designs were also copied. Although Val did add a cylindrical tuning slide mounted in the lead pipe, and the rotary valves themselves, as you see, featured a unique 90 degree layout. Now, although the earliest Wald tubas followed the Moritz design, the later versions featured um, narrower bells and a corpus design. Two of Wald's apprentices, Lars Olsen and Olaf Alberg, moved from Landskrona to Stockholm in 1850 to establish their own firm, Alberg and Olsen. Unlike Wald, A and O mass produced their tubas, a bit, although robust, at a somewhat lower level of craftsmanship. Uh, photos from the time and drawings reveal a considerable number of children in the factory, so just to demonstrate now. Um, also distancing them from Val, A and O quickly expanded their bore and bell profiles, with the last style of these tubas being made in 1950, being a bizarre mix of modern large bell profiles, but with the mid-19th century 15.5 millimeter Berliner pumping valves. Uh, in addition, they featured their own unique uh, unique fingering system, similar to French sax horns in some cases, but they also use an adjustable tuning bit in the lead pipe itself rather than a tuning slide. To this day, thanks to their popularity and mass production, many of them still exist and are in constant use, and even a number of military wind bands in Sweden use them as almost everyday workhorses. Um, Denmark also produced their own version of bass tubas in F and E flat, best represented by those from the emigre makers Peter Schmidt, born in Germany, and Josef Gottfried from Austria. They were made in relatively large numbers, like their Swedish neighbors, but retained a number of traits more similar to the older German tradition. So for example, the two plus three fingering system was identical to the Moritz tubas, and the build quality of the instruments, especially from the firm Gottfried, was far closer to the high standard established by Moritz. The Schmidt tubas, were some of the, quote, for us, modern plane design bass tubas, with an overall size roughly the same as the Moritz in terms of height and valve bore, but the corpus volume, the bell, the bows, were much larger, and the bell flare itself has an unusually severe flare. Um, the Gottfried tubas themselves have, probably due to their close proximity to Sweden, have a very similar design to the Swedish valve-made tubas, again, often with five to six valves, 
at a right angle turn after the first three valves and with a very narrow body profile and a much smaller bell than most of its other Scandinavian contemporaries. The handwork of this instrument is often beautiful and simple, although without the decoration of the Moritz instruments. Like Schmidt, these tubas also sported tuning slides built into their lead pipes and, interestingly enough, were occasionally conical in design. Both of these Danish firms made their last base tubas, as far as we know at this moment, in the late 1890s, perhaps the early 1900s for Gottfried, after which changing tastes and finances led to cheaper imports and inevitably larger instruments. Nevertheless, we do know from a very small number of photographs that a Schmidt tuba was likely used for a number of Carl Nielsen orchestra work premieres. Meanwhile, back in Germany, copies of Moritz's design also emerged rapidly in Germanic states. Zetscher of Berlin produced his version around 1850, and some of you might <coughs> recognize this from, from a link to the Hanover Zetscher. This is the Berlin Zetscher, yeah, just to be clear. That's a mistake if anyone sees that, yeah? So Zetscher of Berlin produced this version around 1850s, and the main differences are the bell profile and the, wave, uh, the valve tubing layout although by 1844 the original Morin's patent had expired, but they were still aware of this patent. Um, subsequent Berlin makers such as Julius Lemke, then his successor uh, Ernst Polus, and later by his successor in 1899 Arthur Sprintz, all made versions of the Moritz Bass tuba. By the 1850s, such manufacturers had dropped the Berliner Pumpen in favor of rotary valves on all but the cheapest budget so instruments, while by the 1860s the bell size <coughs> began to grow in probable response to the larger Bohemian bombardons emerging from the firm Treveni and those that he inspired elsewhere in Central Europe. By Sprintz's time after 1899, the body size of the tuba grew. One could almost say that the last bass tubas by Sprintz were mostly what we would consider modern tubas or bombardons with a Vienna style or Vienna, st Vienna style layout. Um, by the 1880s, the Paulus tuba, uh, mentioned here by Jack, used by Otto Brooks, found its way into the workshop of Leopold Ullmann in Vienna, who then copied the instrument quite closely and thus created the first Viennese Wiener tuba. Um, it is uh, yet unclear exactly when the sixth valve was added to these instruments. The first confirmed tubas from Vienna with six valves can be dated to the 1890s, although as you've seen, the Scandinavian manufacturers had already produced six valve instruments a full generation earlier. Um, back in Berlin, uh, sorry, just to show a general timeline to give you an idea how they oriented themselves, yeah? The 1930s Trevany F-tuba, this was a tuba that became the basis for the BNS Symphony F-tuba, which basically dominated the mid and late 20th century in terms of modern F-tuba design. Before that, then, you had the bus tubas, so, yeah? Okay. Um, back in Berlin, uh, Berlin French horn, mostly known for French horn maker Albert Clay, also built two of the last Wiener tubas for the Berlin State Orchestra sometime around 1918 to 19. The fact that this particular instrument is almost identical to the 1885 Ullmann bass tuba demonstrates a dramatic slowing down of the developmental process in the bass tuba's history. The instruments made by various manufacturers after 1920, known later to us as Wiener tubas, were simply modern, larger bombardons with a Wiener-style valve layout. By the 1930s, most orchestras were already using bombardon-style F-tubas, which is a transitional process that will now be discussed by Jack. In the late 19th century, European military band instruments were brought to the USA by émigré musicians. For example, John Philip Sousa's first band of 1892 included German bombardons built by Rudolf Sander. Given the lack of indigenous practices, these instruments were quickly assimilated into local orchestras. Notably, Danish-Norwegian military musician August Helleberg immigrated in 1878 and began playing with the New York Philharmonic in the following year before incidentally joining Sousa's band. A generation later, when conducting the Philadelphia Orchestra in 1933, Leopold Stokowski, quote, suggested that the tuba player, Mr. Philip Donatelli, who himself had immigrated in 1905, obtain an instrument more pipe organ-like in scope and breadth. This led to the acquisition of tubas from the York Band Instrument Company, shown here, described in the 1938 to 39 catalog as America's standard symphonic bass and were similar to those in use by Fred Geib, Helleberg's successor at the New York Phil, who had immigrated from Germany in 1888. Donatelli's pupil was Arnold Jacobs, commonly described as the father of modern orchestral tuba playing, whose own pupils included Roger Bobo, who played with the Royal Concertgebouw Orchestra from 1962. 
The following influx of influential American tuba players and teachers quickly led to such instruments being omnipresent in European orchestras and the simultaneous demise of the national orchestral tuba traditions which had stemmed back to the vena tuba. What can therefore be, occurred, be observed occurring between roughly 1920 and 1970 is the subsumption of the orchestral tuba in Europe by instruments that had previously been referred to as bombardons, a term used since the late 18th century to refer to generically any low, loud wind instrument destined primarily for outdoor military service. Today, Trevaney's Kaiser designs of the 1880s are the most popular in the Germanic, Slavic, and Russian-speaking worlds, Sax's wide-bore contrabass sax horns of the same time maintained popularity in France and England, where they were also known as bombardons, and American instruments that themselves emerged around the turn of the century from a combination of these two designs are popular across the world. Instrumental choice today is firmly in the hand of the performer, incidentally even when concerning orchestras and ensembles otherwise devoted to historically informed performance. These productions shown here of Das Rheingold by the Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment in 2004 and Concerto Köln in 2021 both clearly use bombardon-style instruments of a common mid-20th century design. Given the dramatic growth of military and commercial enterprises across Europe between the mid-19th and mid-20th centuries and the relative scarcity of instruments intended for the concert hall or opera house, it's not surprising that an unconscious bias towards bombardon-derived tubers is, exists to this day, not only in performance practice and pedagogy, but also in instrument collections and research institutions. In 2017, Herbert Heider wrote that the modern tuber shares characteristics of reprex tuba, the generally wide bore, and the bombardon, conical bore, wide flaring bell, but the sound qualities follow more the line of the bombardon. It remains the task of organology to fill the history of both these instruments with measurements and bore profiles to reject or verify this hypothesis. Such organological work is now underway, but it also remains the task of performance practice research to examine this hypothesis, one which is much further behind, and will require the production of brand new instruments, as will now be discussed by Jake. Um, instrument production, for the most part, as most makers would tell you, reflects the customer demand. And as such, bass tuba style instruments have not really been produced in large quantities now for perhaps over a century or almost a century. Um, as a tubist myself, uh, I'm aware of the challenges presented by using those instruments, although technical production concerns are often much lower than, than involving modern concepts of timbre and sound production. Uh, in other words, not to be rude, the musicians themselves are often the largest hurdle. Apologies. Um, the relatively small size of the instrument compared to a modern tuba, combined with the historical figuring system of 3 plus 3, is a difficult hill for modern tubas to climb. Uh, perhaps even more difficult are the oft required hemispherical design mouthpieces. Using a modern tuba mouthpiece often results in untenable intonation and uneven response. The first generations of Mord's tubas have cylindrical lead pipes, and as such, require a hemispherical mouthpiece with a very sharp angle between the cup and the throat, also Zähle auf Deutsch, in the backboard to raise the internal pressure ensuing a good response and intonation. Um, performance practice concerns aside, producing such instruments today does not present many significant manufacturing challenges, but there are some interesting curiosities that I have encountered as I've sort of rediscovered the processes in producing these instruments. Um, if you take the instrument maker exam in Germany, the Meisterprüfung, you are usually required to make the bottom bow of a baritone or a Kaiser baritone, which are extremely similar to a vino tuba in terms of the production process. When you bend such a bow, great care is taken to ensure that the internal bore profile remains as circular as possible. However, every, and yes, I do mean every Berliner or vino type tuba that I have measured has had some degree ovular bottom bows, with Moritz's tuba being the most circular, but still not round, I would say. When I made my first prototype, I did, of course, my best to ensure that the bottom bow remained true. But after I assembled and tested my round instrument, I found it out of tune. After much speculation and testing different lead pipes, mouthpieces, and valves, I realized the bottom bow needed to be a bit oval, but just a bit. It is, of course, possible to build a vena tuba round, but it would require deviating from the original design somewhat. In a sense, the imperfection allowed for a more stable intonation. Oh, sorry, 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 yeah, sorry. Um, my fault, sorry. Um, 
Okay, the, the images, right, and the dimensions illustrate the dramatic physical difference between the vena tuba and those in common usage today. Uh, for the audio demonstration, here are a couple of excerpts of the sound worlds created by the vena tuba using examples of contemporaneous compositions. First, an excerpt from the famous Wurm solo from Das Rheingold performed on this Danish Schmidt tuba from the 1880s, quite similar in form to the Paulus tuba used at the premiere. Months later, the orchestra in Vienna would premiere Johannes Brahms' Second Symphony, who had originally sketched a part for contrabass trombone, but this was changed to bass tuba by the time the manuscript was produced. Here is an excerpt from the last movement of the symphony played on the same tuba, but creating quite a different timbre. One last, uh, sorry, just uh, given, given that Brahms wrote bass tuba, but Wagner wrote contrabass tuba, just to say, <laughs> contemporary practice dictates that Brahms's music is played on an instrument in F or E flat, such as that on the left, while Wagner's one in C or B flat is shown on the right. Comparative examples between these instruments and more can be found at the following link. And thank you, everyone. Yeah.